One of the main issues today is climate change. When I say one of the main issues is the, all the candidates for the election have made this one of the foremost ideas of what they want to talk about, uh, candidate. So I figured out by now, uh, concentrate on that particular topic. So with that in mind, I invited my friend, Dr. Perry Phillips, and uh, he and I were roommates at Cornell University in the late 60s. And, uh, we're fossils. So we are fossils. And um, he ended up <coughs> finishing his PhD and then went and lived in Pennsylvania while I went to Ohio, no, Indiana, Iowa, <coughs> and then eventually in 81 I moved to Massachusetts. All right, I don't want to do too much talking. I'm going to let Kim introduce the topic. But what I will appreciate from you is the opportunity to ask questions, because you have heard me talk about this particular topic, and I want to give you the opportunity to interact with him, since he has been doing research in this area, etc. So why not, if you have the opportunity, OK? So I'm going to leave it to you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Howdy. I'm going to say we've known each other for almost 50 years and we're still friends. That says something. Not only that, we're going on to our our 50 years of uh, marriage too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The same not group. to each other. But no, not to each other. <laughs> I, I realize this is Massachusetts, but not to not to each other. I guess. Uh, well, what is it that you got to do? Astrophysics. Which uh, is just a fancy way of saying that what we do is we combine uh, physics that we know here on Earth and try to apply it to the rest of the universe in order to try to understand what's going on. From the formation of galaxies, to the formation of the universe, to the formation of stars, the planets, etc. It really encompasses quite a bit. <clears throat> so, I am a skeptic. <clears throat> and. I'm going to present a five-minute video by somebody else who's a skeptic, and he will explain what we mean by that. But anyways, what I call this talk is uh, Global Warming, Skepticism Amongst Consensus, and that's me, and since everybody else is in the selfies, I thought I would do a selfie of myself as well. First, a disclaimer, and that is that I'm not presently employed nor on the payroll nor receiving any monetary benefits or anything else from oil companies, gas companies, utility companies, coal miners, or anything. Uh, one of the accusations when sometimes people make, uh, uh, try to say that they're a bit skeptical, one of the accusations is, oh, you're getting money from oil companies. Uh, actually, I wish I were getting money from oil companies. I'd probably live in a bigger house in a better area and have a nicer car as well. So any oil companies out there that are interested in me, you know, you can find me here. Um, let me give an outline of the talk. Uh, what I want to do is give a short intro, followed by an overall statement by an emeritus professor at MIT, okay, no shabby institution, who has worked on climate for a long time, and he will show what a skeptic is, what his definition is of a skeptic, and then I want to leave it open to you to ask me any questions you want. And I have a list of questions. Maybe you've heard about the polar ice caps melting or glaciers melting or 97% uh, consensus. You, you, you know, you, 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 raise, you raise the questions. But fair warning, if you don't have questions, I'm going to keep talking, okay? And then we'll try to have some conclusions. And basically two conclusions that I have. But if I told you now, they wouldn't be conclusions. I'd have to wait till the end of the talk. Okay, for the most part, what is interesting is from about 120,000 years ago to about 12,000 years ago, this whole area, and by this area I mean the northern part of North America, all of Greenland, a good bit of northern Europe, etc., was covered with ice. And you say, what about here? Well, let's look at here. You can see that the last ice age, the so-called continental glaciers, as opposed to the valley glaciers that you see when you go to Glacier National Park, or to Greenland or what have you, these glaciers have pushed their way all the way down to the Midwest. I'm, I'm from Wisconsin, 
right in this area here, and yes, I'm a Green Bay Packer fan, right in this area here, that was all covered with ice, and this area was covered with ice. In fact, a good bit of what you find here in the Cape Ann region, all the way down to Cape Cod, are remnants of rocks that have been pushed down here by the glacier that advanced all the way to this area. How much ice was here? Right here, you would have about a kilometer of ice above you. That's about six tenths of a mile. If you were to go to New York 12,000 years ago, obviously there would be no New York there, but let's say the Empire State Building were there. You wouldn't see it because it would be covered with ice. This is how extensive the, the ice was in the area. But, okay, that was the past. We warmed up from the last ice age. And the question is, is the Earth going to keep warming? If so, why? And is the amount of carbon dioxide that we are emitting into the atmosphere, what is it going to do to the atmosphere? Is it going to warm it up to the point where life becomes dangerous? Sea levels rise, etc., etc. Everything melts, and we go to hell in a handbasket, basically. Okay, it might sound a little severe, but when you see what some of the alarmists are saying, it, it almost sounds like that. So, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Now, what does that mean? Well, you don't know what a greenhouse is like. You walk in there, it's a little warmer, right? Okay, carbon dioxide acts like that. And, and let, me, let me just give just a short explanation as to how carbon dioxide works. And methane is that way. And the main greenhouse gas is not carbon dioxide. It's not methane. It is water vapor. Water vapor is the main greenhouse gas that we have. Carbon dioxide adds to it, though. Here's the way it works. Okay, I'm Earth. Sun radiates on me. I warm up. As I warm up, I give radiation back. Infrared radiation. It's like standing close to a radiator in winter. You know, you, you, you feel the heat coming from it. Okay, the Earth warms up, it radiates. Now what happens? The radiation given off by the surface of the Earth has to go through the atmosphere, right? As it goes through the atmosphere, however, molecules in the atmosphere absorb that radiation and re-emit it. So what happens is carbon dioxide absorbs that radiation and then re-emits it. And it re-emits it in every direction, but some of that re-emission is back down to Earth. And that re-radiated heat waves, re-radiated infrared that's re-radiated back down the Earth is what is going to make the Earth a little warmer. You say, oh my goodness, that's a bad thing. No, it's a good thing. Because if we did not have the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, the Earth would be below zero. The reason that we have life on Earth is because throughout Earth's history, we've had enough greenhouse gases, mainly carbon dioxide, that has been able to keep the temperature above freezing. And why is that important? Because it's very hard to live in ice. Okay, <laughs> two things do. But it would be very hard to have life develop in, in, in ice or in an Earth that's surrounded by ice. Okay, so greenhouse gases are okay. They're needed. They're helpful. Carbon dioxide feeds plants, which feeds us. Okay, so it's helpful. The question, though, is whether we're producing too much and what effect that's going to have on the Earth. So, I asked the question, does Al Gore have it right? Al Gore has almost come back from the dead. He was very popular in the early part of the 2000s with his book, An Inconvenient Truth, a movie. Any, any of you seen that movie, Inconvenient Truth? No? Okay, blessed are ye. But he has come back, and he's what we would call an alarmist. And does he have it right? Does the Earth have a fever? And if so, what can be done about it? Well, his view is we have to massively cut our carbon dioxide emission. Well, that's okay if that's the main reason why the Earth is warming, but we'll see if that's really the case. Okay, Richard Lindzen, Emeritus Professor of Atmospheric Physics at MIT, has something to say about this, and you may find this surprising. So, listen to what Richard Lindzen has to say. I'm an atmospheric physicist. I've published more than 200 scientific papers. For 30 years, I taught at MIT, 
during which time the climate has changed remarkably little. But the cry of global warming has grown ever more shrill. In fact, it seems that the less the climate changes, the louder the voices of the climate alarmists get. So let's clear the air and create a more accurate picture of where we really stand on the issue of global warming, or as it is now called, climate change. There are basically three groups of people dealing with this issue. Groups one and two are scientists. Group three consists mostly at its core of politicians, environmentalists, and media. Group one is associated with the scientific part of the United Nations International Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC Working Group One. These are scientists who mostly believe that recent climate change is primarily due to man's burning of fossil fuels, oil, coal, and natural gas. This releases CO2, carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere, and they believe this might eventually dangerously heat the planet. Group two is made up of scientists who don't see this as an especially serious problem. It's the group I belong to. We're usually referred to as skeptics. We note that there are many reasons why the climate changes, the sun, clouds, oceans, the orbital variations of the Earth, as well as a myriad of other inputs. None of these is fully understood, and there is no evidence that CO2 emissions are the dominant factor. But actually, there is much agreement between both groups of scientists. The following are such points of agreement. One, the climate is always changing. Two, CO2 is a greenhouse gas without which life on Earth is not possible, but adding it to the atmosphere should lead to some warming. Three, atmospheric levels of CO2 have been increasing since the end of the Little Ice Age in the 19th century. Four, over this period, past two centuries, the global mean temperature has increased slightly and erratically by about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit or 1 degree Celsius. But only since the 1960s have man's greenhouse emissions been sufficient to play a role. Five, given the complexity of climate, no confident prediction about future global mean temperature or its impact can be made. The IPCC acknowledged in its own 2007 report that, quote, the long-term prediction of future climate states is not possible, end quote. Most importantly, the scenario that the burning of fossil fuels leads to catastrophe isn't part of what either group asserts. So why are so many people worried, indeed panic-stricken, about this issue? Here's where group three comes in the politicians, environmentalists, and media. Global warming alarmism provides them, more than any other issue, with the things they most want. For politicians, it's money and power. For environmentalists, it's money for their organizations and confirmation of their near religious devotion to the idea that man is a destructive force acting upon nature. And for the media, it's ideology, money, and headlines. Doomsday scenarios sell. Meanwhile, over the last decade, scientists outside of climate physics have jumped on the bandwagon, publishing papers blaming global warming for everything, from acne to the Syrian civil war. And crony capitalists have eagerly grabbed for the subsidies that governments have so lavishly provided. Unfortunately, Group 3 is winning the argument because they have drowned out the serious debate that should be going on. But while politicians, environmentalists, and media types can waste a lot of money and scare a lot of people, they won't be able to bury the truth. The climate will have the final word on that. I'm Richard Lindsay, Emeritus Professor of Atmospheric Sciences at MIT, the Prager University. One of the to great. subscribe to our YouTube channel, click here. To help keep our videos free, donate here.
So I'm in the skeptic group. Nobody in the skeptic group denies that the Earth has been warming. Nobody denies that carbon dioxide can add some temperature to the atmosphere. Well, the two groups between group one and group two, and you know, group three up by themselves, where group one and group two differ is what the extent is going to be. And I feel the extent is really going to be very little. But you say, what about the glaciers? What about the polar ice cap? Uh, what about Hurricane Matthew? What about Superstorm Sandy? Uh, what about all these things that we keep hearing about? Well, what have you heard? Ask me some questions. What, uh, uh, what would you like to see either emphasized, discuss? What questions do you have? Okay, they can go. No, I'm kidding. All right. Would it be okay if I explain a little bit more why I'm a skeptic? Okay, some of the evidence as to why I'm a skeptic? Okay, good enough. Um, point one that I want to make is the temperature changes that we've seen today and the related activities of that temperature change, the warming, the glaciers melting, the sea rising, the polar ice cap melting, etc. we've seen before. Why? Because all those things are related to temperature. Obviously, if it gets warm, the ice is going to melt, the snow is going to melt. If it gets warm, the ocean is going to expand. And by the way, the rise in the oceans, uh, which has been going on steadily since the last ice age, is pretty much a, a, is a heat thing. In other words, the oceans have been warming, you know, warm things expand, cold things contract, and that's what gives you most of the rise. So, let's take a look at what has happened to the temperature in the past. And, would it be reasonable, since people feel that carbon dioxide is the main driver of temperature changes, would it be reasonable to look into the past and see what the correlation is between temperature and carbon dioxide? Would that be a reasonable way to, to, to approach this? Okay, let's take a look at that. Let me go to that part of my presentation, which is right here. PowerPoint is so great. Okay. Right here. <clears throat> now. Get my laser pointer. Well, you see the people on the left, what they're doing, they look like they're freezing. They look like they're right on some ice, and what they are is They've got this special drill here, which is hollow, and what they do is they dig into the ice and go thousands of feet down, but it's a special drill. It doesn't just drill a hole. What they do, the drill is hollow, and after they've done the drilling, they can pull up the drill, and what you have is a core of ice in there, a cylinder of ice. And if you take a look closely at that cylinder of ice, notice you see bands, and one of the bands the bands here look a little bit like tree rings. And just as you can tell how old the tree is by looking at tree rings, you can tell how old the ice is by looking at these layers because each one of these bands represent a year. And the way they form is as follows. You've got snow that falls. Let's say we're talking about Greenland or Antarctica where you have permanent ice sheets. The snow falls, packs, eventually turns to ice, but the snow falls during the winter. During the summer, you get some melting. Not always, though. In some areas, for example, in the higher elevations, the northern elevations of Greenland, the snow does not melt. The same is true of Antarctica. So it stays. However, during the summer, where other places warm up, what you get is pollen, dust, etc. that's kicked up, and you get a layer of that on your snow. Then more snow comes, more dust, pollen, etc more snow, etc., 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 and what you have is these dark and light bands, and by counting from the surface all the way back, you can get an idea of how old that band is, like counting rings in the tree. Okay, so that tells you how old the ice is. It tells you when that particular snowfall fell, 
that form the band. Okay, there are two other things that we need. We've got age. We need to know what the carbon dioxide level is at that time that the snow fell because that will tell us what the level was in the atmosphere. And three, we've got to know what the temperature was, not now, but back then when the snow fell. And then we can make a correlation between temperature and carbon dioxide. Okay, the way we do this is as follows. As the snow falls, it traps air in the atmosphere that contains the carbon dioxide. When the snow packs and eventually turns to ice, a lot of these little microscopic air pockets remain. And those can be examined, and you can look at what the ratio is of carbon dioxide to the rest of the atmosphere. So you can get the carbon dioxide level at the time of the snowfall, because the snow basically traps the carbon dioxide. There's some diffusion, but it traps. So you can tell what the carbon dioxide is. So you can say, back years, 1,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, this was the amount of carbon dioxide that we had in the atmosphere. With me so far? Third, what about temperature? That gets a little bit more involved, so forgive me a second for relating this, but this is so cool, it'd be a shame not to say something about it. The oxygen that we breathe, there are two major forms of oxygen that we breathe. One is what we call oxygen 16. This is about 98% of the oxygen. It's called 16 because we have eight protons and eight neutrons in the nucleus. Add them up. 8 and 8 gets 16. There's another form of oxygen, and that is oxygen 18. It has 8 protons, 10 neutrons. It's a little heavier. So, if you were to form water with both of these oxygen molecules, clearly the water formed from oxygen 18 is going to be slightly heavier than the oxygen formed from oxygen 16. Now you're saying, what are you leading to? Here's what I'm leading to. When you look at water in the sea, for example, what you find is there is a certain ratio of oxygen-18 water to oxygen-16 water. Now the essential point is this. The hotter the temperature, the higher this ratio. The lower the temperature, the less this ratio. So the ratio of oxygen 16 to oxygen 18 that you find in these ice cores is a measure of the temperature at the time that the snow fell. So what do you have? For example, it's warm. More oxygen 18 evaporates. Oxygen 18 water evaporates. It finally gets dumped to snow on Greenland, on Antarctica. Then you go and you measure that, and you can correlate with what's happening today, and you say, oh, this would have been the temperature. It was a little higher in the past. It was a little lower in the past. And by doing that, you can calculate the time, the amount of carbon dioxide, and the temperature. And here's what we find. This is from Antarctica. And we go back about 450,000 years. This is the present right here. As you look back 400,000 years, okay, first of all, the zero line here that you have, that's today's temperature, average temperature. Today's temperature, what they've done, they take today's temperature from about 1979 maybe to about 2010 or something like that, and they say that's the average, and then you use that, and when you look in the past, you say, was the past temperature above today's average or below today's average, okay? And this right here gives you above and below. What are some of the things that strike you about this chart? Anything jumps out at you? I have a yes. question. When's the like ice age on the graph? The ice ages? Yeah, when is it like on the graph? All these cold periods here. Oh. Okay. This is very. I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit more detail here, but all this is ice age. Here. And don't notice something very interesting. Over the last 400,000 years, the average temperature on the Earth has been colder than what it is now. It has been a few times warmer than what it is now. Really warm back here about 325,000 years ago. Notice also a periodicity here. This has to do with astronomy. It has nothing to do with carbon dioxide. All has to do with astronomy. 
And so I think this is very interesting. Warming periods, very few, far in between, a lot of cooling. I think we can be happy that we're in a warming period now rather than the depths of one of these uh, ice ages. <clears throat> we'll look at the present. Now, you say, what about the temperature CO2 correlation? Notice over on the right, we have temperature in the red. Over on the left, we have carbon dioxide. And this is basically the same chart we had before. And you notice that as the temperature increases, carbon dioxide level is high. Temperature increase, carbon dioxide level is high. When the temperature is low, carbon dioxide level is low. You say, well, Perry, this is as clear as the nose on your face, that higher carbon dioxide level is going to produce greater temperatures. And I say, yes, but there's one thing that you have to remember in science. And that is, correlation does not mean causality. Okay? Correlation does not mean causality. That is, just because two things are correlated doesn't mean one thing determines the other. Now, here you not only have correlation, you do have causality, but here's the interesting thing. When you look at the stuff really carefully, you find first the temperature rose, and then about 800 years later, the carbon dioxide rose. It's not the other way around. You do not first have a rise in carbon dioxide and then the rise in temperature. It's just the opposite of what's going on. <clears throat> and that holds all the way across all of these, where I have the arrows up on top. Okay, well, you we can go farther back as well. Uh, there, there are ways of looking at what happened not just 400,000 years ago. By the way, the graph I just showed, how much of this does it? That's how much. <laughs> okay. And you go back hundreds of millions of years, there are also ways of being able to tell what the carbon dioxide level is. Today's carbon dioxide level is about 400 parts per million. <clears throat> Let me put that in perspective as to what it means. What it means is, if you go to Gillette Stadium and you see all the heads out there, now, let's say everybody's wearing a blue hat, except the carbon dioxide people. They're wearing red hats. What you'll find in all of Gillette Field, presently 28 people are wearing red hats. That's the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You say, what was it before the Industrial Revolution, before humans started pumping carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? Uh, let's use Gillette Stadium again. 21 people with red hats. So what you've had over 160 years from the start of the Industrial Revolution to the present is in Gillette Stadium, you would have started out with 21 people with red hats, and now you've got 28 people with red hats, and that's what all discussion is about. And that gives you kind of an idea of what we're, what we're talking about. All right, let's go on to the present. Let's take a look at something a little closer to home. And for that, what we do is we go to Greenland. We do the same thing. We take the ice cores, we look at the age, we look at the carbon dioxide level, we look at the temperature. Carbon dioxide level is down here. Temperature is here. There's a little different average temperature along here. This is a projection of what is going on, etc. Talk to me, what do you see? Forget about the carbon dioxide for now, just look at the temperature. Has it been steady? Big variations, right? Huge variations. And look, the variations are just as fast and even higher than what's being projected now. And yet, back here, the carbon dioxide level was actually decreasing. Here you had carbon dioxide level decreasing as we came out of the ice age. Which kind of emphasizes what I said before, and that is the temperature increases and then the carbon dioxide level increases. So here we're coming out of the depths of the ice age, going into what's known as the Younger Dryas period, very quick temperature drop, very quick temperature increase. Nobody knows why, but we know it's not carbon dioxide because that has been fairly steady. So you have this first part here, Big temperature variations, you have carbon dioxide level through a bottoming out, slowly starting to increase. 
Carbon dioxide level is increasing. The temperature is oscillating considerably here, but fairly steady. Then you have the jump into the Minoan period, Roman period, medieval warming period. So what? The so what is when the temperature gets warm, culture advances. In 1500 years BC, you had great advance in civilization, the Minoan civilization and the Mycenaean civilizations in the Mediterranean, in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, basically Greek, Greek Isles, etc. All of a sudden, at the end of this, you begin to get invasions from the north coming down south. Roman period, warming, again, great advance in civilization. The, 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 you include the Greeks in there too. The Greeks and the Romans, great advance in civilization. Drop in temperature. What happened? Does the temperature drop? The Goths, the Visigoths, in other words, the barbarians started coming in from the north. Why? They've got to grow food. Their farming areas are being taken over by snow. The period of growing isn't as great. So you get the invasions coming down and the destruction of the Roman Empire. Medieval warming period, again, great advances in technology, etc. In other words, these warm periods were really very beneficial to humanity, not detrimental to humanity. And even today, when you find more people in the world die from cold than from heat. In fact, a very interesting statistic is that over the last uh, 30 years, the temperature in the United States has become um, more even. In other words, the winters in the United States have been slightly warmer than normal without a corresponding increase in the summers being warmer than normal. So what you've had is things that have the, the, the winter temperatures have increased some, but not the summer temperatures, which is very interesting. Uh, much of the discomfiture of some people because they say, oh no, that just means people aren't going to get excited about global warming and what are we going to do, etc., etc. Well, you see what's going on at the end there too is you find, again, not a great correlation between the increase in carbon dioxide, which now is up to here. Notice from the Minoan warming period, Roman warming period, medieval warming period, the average temperature has been decreasing, even though the carbon dioxide level has been increasing. What am I trying to say? Here's what I'm trying to say. We've seen this all before. Sun temperature variations, sun cooling, and it's not related to carbon dioxide. There's something else going on. And what's the other thing What might be going on? Remember what Lindzen said? You've got astronomical orbital things you have to take care of, solar things that you have to take care of, ocean, winds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, this whole thing is not like your thermostat on your wall at home, where you want to increase the temperature, you turn it to the right. You want to decrease the temperature, you turn it counterclockwise. You turn it to the left. And people are acting as though carbon dioxide is like one big thermostat. That if you turn it to the right, the temperature goes up. If you turn it to the left, the temperature goes down, and it just ain't so. So part of my thesis is why I'm a skeptic is because we've seen this all before. That's my first point. Do I know what my second point is? My second point is, the models don't work. Now what do we mean by model? People take what they think is the best explanation as to what is happening in the climate, and they try to project what's going to happen in the future, and the future projections lean very heavily on carbon dioxide. Now, to show you how complicated this process is, we'll let me go back to here. Before I do that, I want to show you another video. And uh boy, are you guys lucky you don't have to listen to me all the time. Anybody recognize this person? Richard Feynman. Brilliant physicist. Who, by the way, taught at Cornell for a while before he went to, to Caltech. <clears throat> this is in the early 60s. Unfortunately, he had left by the time we had gotten there. And he's talking to a group of students. I hope you notice how differently dressed the students were back then than what they are now, and that including, including the professor himself. Well, now I'm going to discuss how we look for a new law. Or make it in general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. Then we took, well, don't laugh, that's the 
really true. Then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what, if this is right, if this law that we guess is right, we see what it would imply. And then we compare those computation results to nature, or we say compared to experiment or experience, compare it directly with observation to see if it, if it works. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. In that simple statement, it's the key to science. It doesn't make a difference how beautiful your guess is, it doesn't make a difference how smart you are, who made the guess, or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all it's true. <coughs> it's therefore not unscientific to take a guess, although very <coughs> people who are not in science think it is. For instance, I had a conversation about flying saucers some years ago with Lehman. Because <laughs> I'm scientific, I know all about flying saucers. So I said, I don't think there are flying saucers. So the other, my antagonist said, is it impossible that there are flying saucers? Can you prove that it's impossible? I said, no, I can't prove it's impossible. It's just very unlikely. That, they say, you are very unscientific. If you can't prove it impossible, then why, how can you say it's likely that it's unlikely? Well, that's the way that is scientific. It is scientific only to say what's more likely and less likely, and not to be proving all the time possible and impossible. To define what I mean, I finally said to him, listen, I mean that from my knowledge of the world that I see around me, I think that it is much more likely that the reports of flying saucers are the result of the known irrational characteristics of terrestrial intelligence rather than the unknown rational efforts of extraterrestrial intelligence. <laughs> it's just more likely, that's all. And it's a good guess. And we always try to guess the most likely explanation keeping in the back of the mind the fact that if it doesn't work, then we must discuss the other possibilities. There we go. Okay, what's the essential point? If you're going to make a model, if you're going to have a theory, regardless of whatever scientific realm you are in, you make predictions. If the predictions are true, there is a good possibility that your model, that your theory is correct. If the predictions do not match observations, then there is also a very high probability that your models are incorrect. So the thing to do then is, let's take a look at some of the predictions <clears throat> that emphasize carbon dioxide as the main driving force for the increase in temperature. And for that, I am going to go, let me go here. What are some of the other factors that are involved? What are all the factors that are involved in trying to figure out what's going to happen in the future? You see a lot of things here, and you see arrows. These are called feedbacks, because the minute you change one thing, you change something else. All of you are familiar with positive feedback. If you have a microphone that's too close for a speaker, the, speak, the microphone picks up noise from the speaker, it amplifies it, it gets worse, you finally have screaming and all that, <clears throat> you have feedback. All sorts of feedbacks that are here. This particular diagram in and of itself should show how complicated it is to make models that are going to tell you what's going on in the future, especially since this is the big unknown. You know what the biggest greenhouse gas is? It's not carbon dioxide. It's not methane. It is water vapor. Yes, yeah, your biggest greenhouse gas. And how that acts with temperature is a big deal. What kind of clouds it forms, etc. Now, what do people do when they make models? You want to start out at least what we call to a first approximation to try to see if the model is correct. And the way you do that, you see what it did when you tried to model the past. Okay, we know what the temperature was, we know what the carbon dioxide level was for the last 20 years, if we're going to make a model that's going to try to predict what's going to happen for the next 20 years, at least you would like to have it be pretty close to what has happened in the past 20 years. And that gives you some confidence that maybe you'll be right in what's going to happen in the future. But the only way you're going to show that you're right what happens in the future is the way to the future, not to do only past studies. Now, this is something that came out from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. They've come out all in favor of, I would say, more group one, more of the alarmist kind of stuff. And you can read for yourself, but 
about the model making, but what I want to emphasize is the stuff that I have in a different color. These models, that is the ones that I'm going to show you, apply the best understanding science has to offer about how our climate works and how it will change in the future. That is how the climate's going to change in the future. Notice what it says. These are many, there are many such models and all of them have been validated to varying degrees by their ability to replicate the future climate excellently. Not quite what it says, is it? By being able to replicate what happened in the past. In my view, that is fine. That's a first approximation. But what have you done for me lately? What is the future going to be? Okay? This is not a way that you determine whether a theory is correct or not. The way you determine whether a theory is correct is by making future predictions and then seeing what's going on. Okay, what are some of the complications that you might find? We know that the ocean has a huge effect on climate because it absorbs and releases heat. Some of the changes in the ocean, so-called oscillations, some of those changes take place over 30 and 60 years. We haven't, we haven't studied things for that long. If you want to see what a 30-year oscillation does in terms of future climate, you've got to wait, would you say, at least 30 years? But even then you wouldn't know because then you have a statistic of one. You have to wait at least 60 years, more like 90 years to see what's going on. And then you can see whether your model has correctly taken into account the, the oscillation that you have in the ocean. So being able to reproduce past climates is a good first approximation but if you follow what Feynman said, which is absolutely correct, that is not the way you prove that things are correct. Yes? So that saying they built models that were, that didn't include the past climate, but replicated them like accurately? Yes, accurately replicates the past. Okay. Yes. So and, and so, and, and, and you make first approximation, second approximation, third approximation. What I mean by that is, okay, you make an approximation that fits the past. And then you wait five years and you say, oops, I blew it. I need to make some adjustments. So you, you reconfigure your model. Now you have it conforming over the last 10 years. You wait another five years, oops, I blew it again. I've got to make more readjustments. You readjust it again. And now it follows for 15 years. You go up another five, five years. You see how it goes? So you do what we call first approximation, second approximation, third approximation, etc. Yes? Do you know anything of the AAS? Oh, the, this right here? No, it's that government. It is basically scientists that have an organization that uh, is composed of uh, working scientists, academics, probably some government people in there that work for NASA, NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, etc. A lot of people involved. So huge organization. They have a meeting every year in various places and, they, and thousands of people come. It's, it's a reputable organization, but I think they've gone a little bit off the deep end when it comes to their alarmism. Well, let's take a look at models and comparisons. <clears throat> there are many models that I'll show you in the, in, in the next slide. This is their average. Well, you have variations in the models as well. Some people emphasize the carbon dioxide more than others, etc. This is the average. You can see that when you look in the past, you have some correlation to what's going on, but as you go into the future, you're finding the divergence between the models and the observations. Well, what is that on average? How many models? All of these different lines, it's called a spaghetti diagram, all of these different lines represent a different model because people are emphasizing different things. The very fact that you have this much variation in the temperature predictions by 2020, we're not even going to 2100 yet, the 2020, the very fact they have this much variation should be a key to us in and of itself that this is a very complicated problem. Otherwise, you would think that all the models would kind of focus in. And the black line here is what I showed before that was a red line. This is the average of all the models. Let's uh, straighten this out a little bit because right now it looks like a bad hair day with the wind blowing in from the left. <clears throat> Let's straighten them out. Observations, models, here it is. We straightened out the spaghetti. 
gives you a little better idea of the division between the models and the data. Now, when you look at something like this, I'm going to say something here that would get me in trouble in some places. When you look at something like this, what has to change? The data or the models? You have to change the data, the models. And yet it seems like in certain parts, um, fortunately, of this whole discussion, people now are going back and trying to change the data and looking back to, oh, you know, those temperature measurements that we made in the past, guess what? Unbelievable. We blew it. The temperatures are really a lot warmer than what they what we thought they were. And and, and, and my opinion is that some of that is happening. Well, you see the point I'm making. So the first point I've made is that the temperature variations that we see presently have occurred in the past. They're not totally related to carbon dioxide, or if they're related, it's weakly related. Second, the models don't work so far. Now, there's been there's been adjustment to this. Um, by, oh, by the way, if you think the Americans are any better at making models than the rest of the world, uh, surprise, surprise, they're not. But uh, here's another way of looking at this. <clears throat> Your best data for the average temperature of the Earth come from satellites, and these are two different satellite measurements that are made, the RSS group and the UAH group. These are well known in climatology. Those are the groups. This is the average temperature that they have measured over the period of those models. These are individual models. And what you do in the individual model, you can make certain adjustments so that you look at an individual model and you say, you know, I'm trying to make a realistic model here. I can change some of my parameters, but this is the best I can do. Here, this model, okay, whatever it is, whatever is being emphasized here, I can make slight variations, and my model says that the temperature may go from here to here. If I take all the models and do the same thing, this is what I get, this is all the models, and basically what we're saying is that the mean of all the models should give me a temperature from here to here, maybe from here to here, but the average temperature is still less than what's been predicted. Now that was 2007. Again, you asked what you've done for me lately, and these are the 2013 predictions. 2013 was the last assessment report by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. There are two things that you've got to be aware of. First, you want your model to conform to present measurements at least. Second, you can make changes in your model, but there's still got to be a realistic model. A good friend of mine is an economist, and he wrote a paper showing that his model uh, basically was able to forecast a certain economic activity that was going on in some industry. He says, I published the paper, but I knew internally that all the factors in my model were wrong. In other words, you can adjust enough things to make it conform to the present reality, but are all your assumptions going into the model correct? Well, what these people do, they've got to constrain their models so that the amount, the, that the models at least conform to reality, that the assumptions that are going into it are correct. And these are the two lines that you showed, showed in the previous graph. And notice what is interesting is with realistic models, they still tend to predict a little higher temperature than what the temperature really is. And I'm going to go out on a limb here. These models were put together in 2013. I'm going to guess that by 2020, we're going to find exactly the same thing, as that is that the temperature is really less than what's been predicted. Now, what's important about these models? All of them make carbon dioxide the principal means by which the Earth is warming. I'm going to repeat two things. Why am I a skeptic? A, we've seen all this before. B, the models are not working. Which brings me to a C. What do I think it is? Quite honestly, I don't know, but I'm leaning more and more towards, I think the sun has far more to do with our climate than what carbon dioxide has to do with it. And that's a very long, involved discussion, so I, I, I won't get into that. It does not have to do strictly between, because of variations in the amount of 
uh, in the intensity of the sun, there's a lot more going on there with magnetic fields and all that. But uh, that's my spiel. And uh, oh, I think we still have a couple minutes for questions that you might have. Yes? Assuming group one and two, uh, uh, excuse me, one and three were correct, how much do you think the sea level will rise in, say, like a thousand years? Well, a thousand years is a long time to <clears throat> predict, but what I can do is show you at least what has happened in the past with sea level rise. Hold it. Oh, let me go here. I can find it a little faster. Sea level rise is down here. I'm not stalling. Here we go. This is from the University of Colorado, as you can see on the lower left. And they're kind of the keepers of sea level. This goes back to 1992, and you can see that the rate has been about the same, about 3.3 millimeters per year, okay? Now, that goes back to 1992. Uh, can we go beyond that? Yes. We can go all the way back to 1880, which is just soon after coming out of the Little Ice Age and the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, these are tide gauges. This here is what has happened since the time of satellites when you get an overall view of what's happening. Here's what's interesting, that the rate at which the sea level has risen from 1880 to the present has been pretty much the same. And you say, what about today? Well, you want to go back a few thousand years, this has happened a few thousand years, and why is the sea level so much less back 10,000 years? because all that water is ice on the continents. And then as that melts, it raises the sea level. And um, let me show you something. Let me show you something else, okay? <clears throat> all of you, have you heard of Superstorm Sandy? That hit? Um, let me just see what's happening recently with the... Um, Battery New York has a nice tidal gauge that you know, the whole idea of Superstorm Sandy is that, oh, the sea level has risen so fast recently that that is why that storm flooded everything that happened, flooded the area. It's really not that. It turned out to be an astronomical thing. There was an unusual high tide at that time, and the storm hit right at that time. <clears throat> this right here shows you what the change in sea height has been all the way back to 1860. And people claim that recently the ocean level has risen faster. So it looks like it's risen any faster today than what it is now. Here's today. This is now. And yet you'll read in articles, the sea level has been rising four times faster. Well, if you take this small area right there, you might be able to do it, but that's hardly fair. You've got to average it over a longer period than that. Um, uh, an article said that uh, the sea level has risen from Norfolk to Boston so much faster presently than in the past. This goes back to 1920. These, by the way, are tide measurements in Boston Harbor. Uh, notice from 1920 to about 1950, the rate was fairly steady. Then it leveled off. And then it rose at pretty much the same rate as it did from 1920 to 1950. It rose at pretty much the same rate from 1980 to 2010. By the way, I'm not making up these data. Uh, you, you can go online. And that's the great thing about the internet. You can go online to the data centers and you can download this stuff and make graphs. Okay? Fortunately, there are people who do this. So when I see people saying, you know, saying to me, oh, the sea level has just risen so much faster in the last few years than any time in the past. I say that's a lot of horse pucky. That's a lot of BS. And by BS, I mean bad science, okay? Just so you can get the wrong uh, impression here. Thank you very much. Appreciate your questions, appreciate your attention. And, uh, you know, what do you do? You hear one side says one thing, another side says another thing. What do you do? Read, 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 if you're really interested in this. Tony has a, Tony, I mean, Mr. Castro, has an <clears throat> interesting proposal. 
you guys have English classes you have to write uh, papers for, make this one of your topics. Choose sea level change. Choose a uh, change in uh, uh, the level of the ice in the North Pole. Choose the melting of the glaciers in Greenland. Choose the breakup of the Larsen ice shelf, which is a big worry, except for the fact in the last 5,000 years it's happened 20 times. You know, choose one of those things. Go investigate. I think that's but look at the reason. data. That's it. Look at the data, not what people say. Not consensus. Look at the data. I will be like, I will use the same emotions as Richard Feynman. Look at the data. I tend to think of a very good project will be what is the result of inaction? If we don't invest right now in the preventing of CO2, are we dooming the earth? There you have a beautiful term paper. Take care. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you for your attention. Enjoy the rest of your day.